Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being a part of Say Your Peace, Black Women, Mothers, Martyrs, and Misunderstood. I am Stacey Watson, the Director of Equitable Partnerships at the National Quilt Museum, and I had the pleasure of curating this exhibit. And I just want to say thank you so much for joining us this morning. And I just want to go ahead and jump on in and just get started and introduce everyone today, if you don't mind, as far as our featured quilt artists, Miss Nicole Blackwell, O.V. Brantley, Miss Sean Kimber, Miss LaShonda Crow Storm, Miss Janda Lipker, and Rebecca Lipker. Just like to thank all of you for being here today. And I know that we have a couple of artists who were not able to attend from the Social Justice Stone Academy and Ms. Patra Jones. And hopefully we get a chance to speak to them before our exhibition ends on February 21st. So I just wanna just, just come around and um, start off with you, Ms. Nicole Blackwell, and just tell us about yourself um, as far as you know what inspires you and motivates you to quilt and start quilting. Oh, so um, hello, everyone. My name is Nicole Blackwell, and I began my quilting journey as a way to remember my maternal grandmother, Carrie Mae Covington. Uh, when she passed away, she left a set of house dresses that she wore on a daily basis, pretty much, as she helped to raise me and my siblings. She lived with us, and, and um, she was our constant um backbone for the entire family so those house dresses sat in a drawer forgotten for many years and um i wanted a way to make something that we could enjoy and that could be passed down to her descendants as a way to introduce carrie may um to them so it's uh making a quilt seemed a very natural way uh, to do that. And so that's how I began my quilting journey. Um, in terms of my inspiration for um, uh, the quilt before you, um, the Sankofa quilt, was also a connection to my ancestry. Um, I spent the past 15 years researching my maternal grandmother, Carrie Mae Covington's uh, family history. And um, her grandmother, Lucy McRae, was born on a cotton plantation. Mm -hmm. So um, I used the Sankofa symbol as a way to give voice to those that had been silenced for so long. Um, the Our history of um, enslavement um, has stuck with me uh, in terms of just trying to unearth um, the lives of those that have been um, intentionally uh, hidden from us for so long. So um, the, Sankof the Sankofa bird is the symbol that I chose to represent my process of doing my ancestry, uh, my genealogy. And um, I looked at my past 15 years of trying to piece together the story of Lucy's life um, as a similar process of piecing together a quilt. Um, so I'm trying to put together her story um, in the same way that I would put together a quilt. So that's a little bit about me and my, my quilting journey. Okay. Now, when we look at the Sankofa bird here, carry me back Sankofa bird with this quilt, I know that this is about a hundred uh, four inch background squares and you're using different African fabric for each square, is that correct? That is correct. Mm -hmm. And so basically you have about 140 quilted circles that are within the quilt and all of this is hand quilted. So each, each of those, um, there's a hundred squares on there that have a uh, hand appliqued uh, African fabric. The, the African fabric is hand appliqued on the blue background. Okay. And then those, those 100, it's a 10 by 10, 
those 100 squares are um, machine pieced together. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. And, and like you said, I used African fabrics and I used batiks to, nice. learn, to create the bird. Nice. And I do see the flying geese pattern as well. So um, that's, that's awesome. And I know that you were our featured um, block of the month artist for the month of November. How did you feel um, actually seeing everyone submit this pattern for block of the month here at the National Quilt Museum? You know, it was, it was very interesting to see how people interpreted um, my Sankofa pattern. What I chose to do, since it was a, a 12 by 12 um, inch um, block for the block of the month, I chose to represent the Sankofa bird as a pieced item. Um, the one for the quilt is actually um, applique, you know, and then each, each block is pieced together. But I, I chose to make a simpler bird that was pieced together that I thought would be appropriate for, um, you know, a 12 by 12 inch block. Um, the various interpretations I thought were awesome. You know, um, the fabric choices that the participants made um, and the way they were able to, um, you know, make the block their own was very impressive. Um, uh, I just, I really enjoyed how they were able to, um, you know, step up and, and um, make their own, um, figure out a way to put it together, you know, in their own way that spoke to them. Uh, I was very impressed by that part of the process. Perfect. Well, I thank you for sharing your story and giving us some insight on the Sankofa bird. And, uh, you know, we'll come back to you hopefully at the end so we can talk about how you feel about saying your piece uh, overall, the exhibition and what this quilt may mean to you um, in this exhibition. So I want to go ahead and move over to Miss Ovi Brantley and talk to you about your piece that you have. And I know that that is focusing on a potion to cure racism. So Ms. Ovi Brantley, can you talk to us about this quilt and the fabric pieces and techniques you used? Okay, good morning. Um, the first thing I would say about this quilt is it was, in it was never intended to be in the National Quilt Museum. It was just intended to be a personal quilt because I like to decorate my home uh, with seasonal quilts and I didn't have a Halloween quilt. And so it started out, I was just looking to make a Halloween quilt and maybe there was something on the TV with you know, like today with racism and mm -hmm. uh, a lot of uh, what I would say is negativity, because normally I try to make happy quilts like the one in the background uh, mm -hmm. that I'm sitting in front of. But at any rate, I started this Halloween quilt and then it kind of took me back to my roots in Crossett, Arkansas. I grew up in a little small town, 6,000 people basically in the country. And in the South, back in the day, there was always a root lady. And that was a lady who could go out in the woods and find the right roots and she could bring them back to you. You would you could sprinkle them, sprinkle them around your husband's bed to make him act right or whatever the problem was the root lady could go out in the woods and find the roots to solve the problem and so I started thinking well what if we had a root lady today who could just go out in the woods and get some plants and roots and stir them all together and make racism go away mm. and so from there I started thinking about what would it take to make racism go away? What types of roots? And so I added to the uh, witch's brew down in the grass where her roots would be. Okay. If you look closely, there are words like love and 
uh, peace and mm -hmm. whatever I could think of that I thought people should focus on to make racism go away. So my Halloween quilt turned into a social justice quilt. Nice, nice. And can you tell us about the techniques that you use or fabric pieces um, to create this quilt? Um, mostly the pot and the smoke and the handle and all of that is applique. I love applique. And um, the quilt is hand quilted. And I also love incorporating uh, African fabrics in traditional quilts. I consider myself a traditional quilter. Okay. I love traditional methods like uh, normal piecing and applique and quilt blocks. And I try to make them my own by adding unusual fabrics uh, that I have collected around the world as I've traveled. So this quilt has some African fabrics in it and um, it is hand quilted. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much. And um, we definitely have received a lot of feedback. A lot of people, we do have a book um, that is at the museum and it's where people share how they feel about the quilts that they have interacted with in the exhibition. And a lot of people write about your quilt saying that they just really wow. wish and hope to cure racism and they really speak or this quilt speaks to them about that particular subject when we have our audience and guests come in and share their piece. So very positive quilt. And uh, thank you for allowing us to have this a part of the exhibition. Well, thank you for sharing that. That makes me so happy. Absolutely. Now I would like to move on to Ms. Sean Kimber. And speaking about your quilt, Stop the War on Women. And Ms. Sean, you have three quilts in our exhibition. And I wanted to focus on this particular quilt to get us started. If you could come on in and let us know, um, just starting off, I know that you are going to, you, you know, you're uh, a household name. Everyone's looking forward to hearing from you, seeing you. I know that you're going to be our keynote speaker at QuiltCon coming up. And I would just like to know as far as what is your technique? What speaks to you when you are making your quilts? Um, yeah, so thank you for having my quilts on the show and thanks for inviting me to this conversation. Um, yeah, I'm initially motivated by the quilts that were on our beds when I was growing up. Um, they were made by my great grandmother with my father underneath the uh, quilts all stretched out on the um, frame. He he was underneath to catch the needles as the ladies were hand quilting. And oh, wow. so quilting to him is his was his connection to his grandmother who raised him. And by extension, it was my connection to my ancestors. And it was they were improvisational in style. Um, much like what you're seeing in the background here with um, discarded denim and, you know, just utility quilts made from what you had. And so, yeah, so my style is quite improvisational, often starting from tradition. Um, the big secret here is that that background is all log cabin squares and um, it's obscuring, but um, I have a technique to make it look like it's not a log cabin. Nice. Awesome. So what brought you to this quilt when we, when you know, Stop the War on Women? Uh, what inspired you to make this particular quilt? Yeah, it's kind of funny. This is the fourth version of this quilt. So the, the first version I made um, was probably in 2013, 2014. Um, and it was for a uh, an auction for Planned Parenthood. And we, we've just always been in a moment where uh, women's health care has been in a tenuous position. Um, you know, abortion can be um, a procedure that's emblematic of that, but women's health care in general is always um, 
well, not well researched. And um, we are always threatened with losing access, right? Planned Parenthood doesn't only do one procedure all day. It is in many communities, the one affordable place where women can go to get pap smears mm -hmm. and HPV tests and vaccines um, that preserve our health. And so I am very much interested in everyone having access to healthcare. And so this was kind of the, the statement that rang to mind for me that was a global statement about still in the 21st century, our status as women, as members of a society, we, we are still not equal right. to men. And so in, at every turn, so even a woman in the C-suite of a corporation is, um, is facing that glass ceiling and I consider it, um, an aggression. And so in all spaces, I would hope that we could stop the war on women. Nice. I mean, that's just, it's just powerful all the way around. And this has been, um, a big, you know, as far as interpretation, our guests coming in and being able to see how you can link um, in any way, shape, or form to stop the war on women. Um, this leaves it up to so much, you know, interpretation on anyone. And when they come in, they're, they're speaking. They don't know if it's associated with healthcare. They don't know if it's associated with police brutality. They don't know what it's associated with. So it speaks to so many people. And, you know, as we continue, there's another quilt that we have of yours in our exhibition, Hope Half Empty. And a lot of people have uh, pretty much have jot down the same thing that you have in your quilt, which is I miss hope. And so they're saying, yes, I agree. I miss hope as well. And I would like for you to uh, just give us some uh, insight on this particular quilt. And I wanted to make sure that we zoomed in and see the stitching as well, because, you know, you have to see this up close to, to really truly get what what you have created here. Um, yeah, so no matter who was going to be elected after Barack Obama, I was going to start missing the hope um, that I felt that our nation could embrace and mm -hmm. elect a Black man into the White House. Um, a scandal-free administration um, that helped us to make some progress, even if it was just in symbolic social change. And um, so as the next administration was heating up, I was starting to try to figure out how to reflect the emotions that I was having in this moment. And it happened to coincide with this realization of the uh, accumulation of gray hairs on top of my head and the sense that planning for tomorrow feels different, right? How far mm -hmm. ahead can I plan now that I'm in my fifties, um, I wasn't 50 yet in 20, okay. um, <laughs> but I was still kind of wondering what does that mean? Like in terms of the amount of hope I have left. And so hope half empty is asking that question about, is this glass half full or half empty? Mm -hmm. Am I able to gain more hope? Or is the hope just draining away as I'm middle-aged, as I have less of a future to have things happen in? Less of a future in which to see positive change in, in the United States and to see Black women gain equality over time, which is still my hope, despite what I'm saying here. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's multi-layered and it has many meanings and... I have found that pretty much anyone of a certain age looking at this, no matter who they are, what their identity is, they can really kind of grasp what I'm trying to say. Absolutely. So can you tell us a little bit about your stitching here? Mm. Oh gosh, I needed a place to put all the tension. <laughs> and so <laughs> stitching super tiny, super densely, um, it, it really was like quilting to me is a meditation that I do. Quilting is my side hustle um, from a very big job, um, helping to run a university. 
And so um, I need a place to put things because I don't, I don't get to yell. I don't get to be out there um, with a visible struggle. And so this is my symbolic struggle comes out in my stitching. Nice, nice. So our next one, um, our next quote that we have is the one for Eric G. And this is um, actually going to not be at the National Quilt Museum um, because it is going to leave our exhibition and head over to QuiltCon pretty soon. So it's going to come down uh, before the exhibition is over because it is such a, you know, a inspirational monumental quilt and, and definitely something that um, everyone needs to see and speak to and uh, share their piece about it. And so I just, you know, we're right in the height of once again, an issue of I can't breathe and police brutality and speaking to this particular injustice. And of course we could say this is self-explanatory, um, but I would like for you to speak to um, this quilt in, in how it inspired and motivated you as well. Um, right, so the title refers to the Eric Garner incident, um, who uh, was killed in a chokehold by a policeman on the corner of Staten Island in broad daylight. Um, these were his dying words, which you, you could hear in viral videos that were out there. Um, and you can actually just hear him dying in, in the video. And to me, these words weren't just his dying words, but were just they symbolize this generalized feeling about the society we live in and reflecting on our complete powerlessness to get any, I don't know, we're never gonna have control over this, but to even reach a sense of justice, a sense of that due process says that we don't have executions out at the place where someone is alleged to have committed a crime. We're supposed to have trials right. that lead to punishments that are proportional to the crime committed. And I'm sorry, this is hopeful, Sean, saying such things because it's not how reality works. So for the alleged crime of stealing a pack of, sorry, buying a pack of cigarettes and then selling them one by one on the street, right? He gets the death penalty without any form of due process. The same happened to George Floyd. Now there, a certain bit of justice was achieved. Um, so for me, um, by the way, this was never meant to see the light of day. I was just making these words as an exercise in somehow trying to cleanse my soul and to just shout in the darkness. And so I just made the words. I made each phrase one at a time, stacked them up, put them in a corner, and then didn't look at them again for a year. At which time I decided, okay, maybe they've um, cooled off enough. And I made the exterior uh, patchwork that it's embedded in. And then even still, it was just going to be a quilt for me that stayed in my house. But the more I talk to people out there in the world, there is a population here that is absolutely ignorant to the incidents that are happening. Even though they're on CNN, there are people who don't know this is happening because they don't have to know. And so I saw this as an opportunity to at least educate or expose people to what's happening in our country and hopefully get them to think twice. And, you know, and at the nth degree, it's hope that they'll become allies to us active allies yes yes beautiful um this is, there's so much to say to this particular piece um I, I i when i go to the museum i 
always tend to peek in on my exhibition just to see how people are receiving the quilts. And there are often a lot of people just standing in front of it and taking it in. And um, they're sharing their piece about this as well. And when we're looking at this, zooming in here, you know, looking at this block, because I wanted to be able to, for people to see the intricate details that you have here. Can you speak to the fabric that you used in this particular piece as well? Mm -hmm. Um. Well, I'll say I knew I wanted it to be black, right? The colors chosen was, I chose white letters because I want it to look like graffiti scrawled on a wall in, in a dark alley so that the words are screaming off the wall at you. And so um, not a lot of modern fabrics are black. And so it turned out that I was completely drawn to Civil War era prints. Mm. And so, of course... That's exactly the statement I'm trying to be making is cotton with Civil War era prints on them. We are grounded in the foundation of the issues that we are discussing here. Um, and then uh, there's some machine quilting on that that I had a long armor do. And that's just my cheater way of uh, basting my quilts sometimes. Uh, but I chose it as a pattern that looked like um, kind of trails or flows of water. And so then I hand quilted the red so that it looks like blood flowing through the cracks of a sidewalk, right? That was kind of my intention with that. Nice. Okay. Thank you so much. And that's why I really enjoy um, being able to speak to each artist about their quilt and their techniques so that we can get a better understanding of what you have created and how it's supposed to speak to those that interact with your work. So thank you so much, Ms. Sean, for speaking to us about your quilts and thank you for being willing to have them a part of Say Your Piece. Thanks. You're welcome. Now I would like to go and speak to our next mother and daughter duo, Janda and Rebecca Lipker. So I would like to speak to you two about your quilt, which is Harriet Tubman, Come With Me. And um, first, Ms. Janda and Rebecca, could you come on and um, introduce who you are, um, our TikTokers? Right. Um, so I'm Rebecca and I drug my mom along on this journey. Drug. And I think it also ties into our piece of come along with me because we're gonna we're gonna do something. It's gonna be great. Uh, so essentially I started our company when I was in law school because quite frankly, you know, I wasn't under enough stress as it was. And I told my mom that I had this idea that like the best time to plant a tree is like basically yesterday, but today works too. So I wanted to build something that had some staying power. And fortunately, she was up for the journey with me. And in 2020, of course, everything changed and the pandemic hits and we wanted to figure out a way to serve our community. So we started doing face masks. And as the CDC guidelines changed, we had a bunch of leftover fabric and you go, OK, well, now what do we do? And fortunately, my mom was here to go, you know, I think we can quilt that. And I go, OK. I don't know how to quilt, but I'm willing to learn because we've always been pretty crafty. And that's where everything kind of took off from there because I thought, oh, you know who should come along on this journey with us? Social media. That'll be great. So I started a TikTok account, uh, which was another thing that was coming up. And I went, I have no idea what the kids are doing, but I want to do it too. And I just started documenting us going through biscuit rag quilts, biscuit quilts, and in an attempt to give my brother a gift because he's really loves anime, we started getting into quilts and tapestries. And next thing you know, the historical quilts happened and Harriet got here. So that's the, the long and short end of how I got here. With also where mom is. Okay, so I, I, my mom, my mother and my daughter at Mississippi, sitting in the quilt group, shelling peas, taking scrap fabric. My job was just to cut the fabric and hand it to them. So I would just... Um, Get the fabric and cut it. Um, so that's kind of how I started quilting years ago. I retired after 31 years and I'm like, I'm bored. Again, she's in law school. My youngest is about to graduate from undergrad. And again, I was like, you know, let's make him a cool piece. He didn't want a traditional quilt. I knew he didn't. So he loves Naruto, 
an anime brand. And so I said, you know what? I think I can quote this. Um, I showed it to Becca. She liked it. She posted 100,000 hits later. Um, we started doing these quotes. Um, but then I wanted to get into more messaging quotes because I'm 60. When she talked about age, I'll be 60 this year. We've only been quoting two years. I've been sewing since I was in third grade. So I love traditional quotes, but I really wanted to pass my quilting on because I was meeting more and more kids who didn't quilt. You don't want a piece, they think. Because once you start, they go, oh, this is not bad. Because if your mother didn't quilt, your grandmother didn't quilt, you don't quilt. And so to get these kids in, our demographic is 13-year-old and up. The comments we get on TikTok is, oh, you can quilt like that? Or you can quilt like that? The biscuit quilt, the rag quilts. So it was our way of introducing just the TikTok people in. Quilts can be whatever you want. You can have you guys amazing type quilts. But you have to start somewhere. So we kind of start people with a kind of little cheat and have them make like a mug rug or something and go, this is quilting. You just make more squares. So it started from there. And then an influencer, well, what's his name? RJ the Magician. RJ the Magician's like, can you do something with Henry Box Brown? And I'm thinking, okay, let me look around. So I have to go back a second. We did like 80 craft shows a year when she was in law school, pray for me. Um, so we did shows. So every time I would see a tapestry, I would buy it. When we saw this one, I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do with it. Harriet Tubman is growing up. We all knew who Harriet Tubman was. And this artist made this beautiful piece. And I'm like, Becca, I don't know what I'm going to do with it. I was just going to hang it in her dorm room at the time or her room. And then I was like, you know what? I can quote that. So this piece has um, over 400,000 stitches and her hands and face is six different color changes. This took over 20 something hours on my long arm to quote. Because we're in a short time frame and I did retire, I bought a long arm because I wanted to learn how to do it. Um, this was a very detailed piece and a lot of colors, but I wanted to emphasize what she was saying. And for me, it was come along this journey. You can quilt, you can sew, you can do these things. And it just has blossomed from there. Um, it's just been an amazing journey for us. And it's just been an honor to be included. But for like many of you, we just did the piece because I absolutely loved it. And I'm just still learning my quilt realm and together with us, just learning what we can do and what we can't do. But I don't think there's anything you can't do in quilting. You can do what you want to do. And that and that speaks a lot to um, you as an artist, because what you just said is you can do whatever you wanted to. And in this case, you had mentioned, I know, Rebecca, you had mentioned tapestry quilting. So talk to us about what that is and what that means to you and how that speaks to you as far as your technique and what you enjoy doing. Yeah, at this point, we've termed it quilted panel painting because we feel like we're at this really interesting intersection of thread painting and traditional quilting when it comes to sometimes what you see like holiday panels. And like a piece like this, for example, if you looked at the original, there's so much detail that wasn't there before that happens during the quilting process on the long arm. So all the lines you see in her dress, some of the extra weathering that's in her face and hands, um, all the detail work and just like the greenery in the background, that's all stuff that you have to paint in with the threads and hence all the different color changes. So that's how we try to tell people about it when they go, well, what makes this different than anything else we've seen before? It's that extra bit of artistry that comes with how you use that thread. Um, and I think when you see it in person, because uh, something that I've been trying to do is talk to people who have received our quotes before and go, how on earth do you explain this to others who haven't seen it in person? And there's a certain amount of emotion and softness and it's it feels just so real in a way that a normal flat piece of artwork just doesn't. Um, in a way that can almost be unsettling in a beautiful way, particularly with Henry Box Brown and Harriet. Uh, we always mention how having her up on the long arm or having her hung up, she looks like she is staring directly at you. And uh, I had her in my office briefly. And it was just feeling like Harriet just looking over my shoulder going, I know you're working today, right? Oh, I know you're studying, right? Because you can't have Harriet looking over your shoulder and you slacking off. Absolutely not. So that's the beauty of our space as far as close with panel painting is concerned. And you know, have you got anything for me? I don't think the only thing that almost, I wouldn't say this way, but we could have had a few, I probably could have my whole career, probably 31 years. So many people tell me that's not cool. Um, I, I tell people now who come to this, we're going to teach in a couple classes and 
I, I was so sad by so many people. I was in probably 12 cool groups. And out of those 12, I dropped out of nine because they were like, that's not cool thing. And I'm like, I can appreciate you don't appreciate it, but I, I just would never tell anyone anything they created or wanted to create is not anything. And that's the part would make me push harder and thankfully has opened up so many opportunities to us because I can go into a library and show our quotes and the kids have a different appreciation. Yes, they know Harry Tubman. But they didn't know her like this. Yes, they know Henry Box Brown and some of the other historical pieces, but it's different when they sit in front of them and we can talk about it where all of a sudden, can I sell, can we sell, can we sell? And again, that's just led to just so many opportunities for us because it's what you wanted to make it. It's make it, make what you want to make. And I'm just glad that we didn't listen. Of course, I never listened. Um, and we kept going on this journey because it's just been a cathartic of so many people we didn't know. And then you quilt them and you learn about them. And it's just been such an amazing experience. Well, I, I definitely appreciate that. And, um, you know, with Harriet Tubman come with me, of course, she's probably the first person that everyone sees when they come to the museum and look at this exhibition because she's drawing people in. And when I curated this exhibition, that's what I was thinking. I wanted people to be drawn into the exhibition that is going to speak to the history of women and what they have, done, Black women and what they have done for, you know, over. For, for pretty much everyone in this case and what they had to go through, what they still go through and how we've helped each other get to where we need to be. And I think when we, when I think of this particular quilt, thinking about um, this exhibition is about what has happened to black women uh, as far as social injustices. And then thinking about all of our quilt artists in this exhibition are Black women. And then, of course, me as a Black woman curating the exhibit, putting all those components together and leading from one quilt to the next. This is the beginning of come with me. Let's let's take this journey together and share in this journey of, of exposing and educating and informing people about Black women in how we are um, as a unit. So I would like for us to now speak to the next Black woman uh, woman here, Ms. Mamie Till Mobley, and how she was essential um, in help kicking off the civil rights movement. Um, a lot of people don't give her the credit, but when we look at this particular quilt, this speaks a lot to the injustices of which we kind of neglect, uh, which is our children. But thinking about the mothers, when we think about this exhibition, uh, mothers, martyrs, and misunderstood, we're talking about the mothers and how they have to unite and come together to mourn uh, losing their children um, to these injustices. So how was it creating and quilting this quilt? Can you speak to us about this? No, please, sir. Yeah. Um, I'm being honest here. This is the most difficult piece um, other than actually trying to do Emmett. Um, Emmett was very hard for me to pull. Um, putting this on the long arm um, as a mother, um, raising two kids, it, it's indescribable when you're looking at this piece and knowing the history of, of what she went through and her losing her child. Um, it, it just felt overwhelming to even just think about what am I going to, you know, how are we going to do this? What are we going to do? Um, pulling the threads and monofilament, non-monofilament. There's there's two different kinds of monofilaments in this and, and the tension and just the struggle in getting it was kind of symbolic of her struggle in a small way, nothing close to what she went through. having to quote this. So um, we emphasized your tears as much as we could because we want that to be such a big part of it. Um, so this for me, again, this is on top. This was just a tough piece to quote. This is just. I understand. Okay. Yeah. I, I think what's so <laughs> interesting about this image and this piece is even in the pain or the struggle that Black women face, you still have to be beautiful and presentable. And that's something when I look at this piece of, here's a mother trying her absolute best and she still has to get dressed up and present this to the world, trying to make a difference. 
and how that's just something, particularly with Black moms, you know, not what here of watching how, how on earth do you do that and bringing that to life via this quilt of here she is through it all, still trying to make a difference and how impactful that is just to be a part of that creative process, but also watch my mom through that process and having those different conversations as she was coming together was, it was a lot, but I'm, I'm really thankful for the opportunity for it. And I'm sorry, just raising girls. And Britain does the same thing. I have one son and one daughter. Raising her, I was blessed. She studied hard. She got through law school. The last one, my son, she's in law school now. And I don't want to minimize everyone else's experience, but raising children and trying to get them to be successful, I can't imagine losing them. You worry about them every day. And that's the part that you, you can't express when you're quilting. Every day I worry about my kids. Every moment I'm thinking about them. Good, bad, or indifferent. So as this mother, I can't imagine losing them. So you want to give her credit and justice. Like you said, you still have to be presentable. No matter what we're going through, we still have to be so strong all the time. And sometimes that's exhausting in itself, but we keep pushing through. So again, with what we're doing with our little business is we want to reach out to the other ones. I don't mind giving up my time. I'm blessed to be able to retire. If it, if it gets somebody else to do what we're doing or something different, just to share our gifts, you guys are so amazingly talented. All I can do is open the door for a couple of people and I'm referring to them all of you. Go look at this exhibit. Go look at these pieces, these pieces that I love. And again, this is to me represents every mother, no matter what race, but especially black women of what we deal with every day right now, probably until the new future. But I want my daughter, if she decides to have kids, hopefully it's a little better. It gets a little better. Thank you. And, you know, of course, we think about Miss Mamie Till Mobley losing Emmett Till. We have to speak to the brutal murder of Emmett Till. And um, we're thinking about children. We're thinking about our young Black men having the talk. And that takes us back to lynching and um, these uncomfortable conversations, which leads us to LaShonda Crow Storm. And LaShonda, I would like to bring you in to introduce you to uh, our audience and your project, the Lynch Quilt Project, Quilting Project, which is um, your baby, your brainchild, and speaking to this particular quilt, a partial listing. Can you talk to us about a partial listing that we have up currently? Yeah. Did you did you want to go to the website? Because then people can see the the actual more of it. Sure. Absolutely. Um, I can see. drop the link for you real quick. No, I can't. I, I done turned it off my own. <laughs> I have it here. Let me see. Okay. okay. There we have. If you go back to the first, look, I'm trying to click it myself. <laughs> you go back to the first image. Sure. Here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that good. Uh, so this quote is what? nine and a half by 15 and a half feet and so it's constructed out of over 7500 blocks uh, each block actually represents uh, when we tallied uh, the lynching roles of the people we could identify uh, and oftentimes people are actually just listed as uh, unknown negro male or unknown whatever uh, and so it the uh, Eventual lynching roles actually begin in 1885 at the end of, con as we see the end of construct reconstruction start, because then Black people became more of a threat, mm -hmm. white people, uh, for lots of reasons. So when you start to the left bottom, so if you go to the picture before, because I think you have it on the horizontal at the museum. So yes. if you start at the top, the color switches um, per year. And so you can track year by year as violence kind of explodes and it shrinks and there's like a steadiness of the violence. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you could go to the next slide. So it becomes a space that we actually teach youth to ask them, well, if this second band of red, which is the the second band is actually uh, 1919, which is known as the Red Summer, 
then you should ask yourself what was happening before that. Because if more people were uh, lynched and died in racial violence, that's actually not true. Uh, it's called the Red Summer, but you can see that it was years before that we actually see even more violence. Um, we call it a partial listing because the reality is you you only know what has been documented. There's lots that didn't. And I always think of uh, my own grandfather who walked out the Mississippi Delta at 13 in 1929. There were no cell phones. There were no hotels. There were no videos. Anything could have happened in that route where he at 13 with his brother walked with no shoes and everything to find this other better life that anything could have happened and no one would have known. He could have ended up either never discovered or he could have just ended up as an unknown Negro male mm -hmm. on the walls. So if you move to the next, oh, so stop here. So it, it took a while. Uh, we had the stats and then we had to tally more uh, whenever you got like strange race riot stats that it would say like 150 to 200. We always go with the higher because we know that that was probably even still the undercount. Um, but for some reason, we started working on it and it got put away. <laughs> we were worked on other projects. And I think I had a baby somewhere in the middle of that. That's probably why I got put in the closet. But in that time, uh, EJI started to do research because the, the entire project started in 2002. And the way they tallied their um stats is not the way that they have historically been tallied which was uh by uh by year by state and so they did some research on uh particular counties and discovered another 800 people but by then we had already worked out um the mathematics of how to lay it out and so because we had started out in red white and blue the tricolor we had we used some similar adjacent colors uh, to include their stats uh, which starts here then uh, what happens is at the turn of every year it actually starts a black uh, stripe or block because that's actually for us to add additional people as we discover them okay uh, and they get added with beads and there's always new people that get added, uh, unfortunately. So years ago, I had been introduced to the East Point Peace Academy and their whole thing was like the U.S. has colleges of war and West Point's on the East Coast. So we're going to call ourselves the East Point Peace Academy and we're located on the West Coast. But they had actually developed a 250 year peace plan. So when you go into peace studies there, you know, the reality is we could we could turn all of this around tomorrow if we chose to. Mm -hmm. the question becomes, why does humanity continue to do the same things again and again? Because it could all stop tomorrow. And I speak from that viewpoint as a person <clears throat> who does actually race dialogue work. And this is what we do daily is have ongoing hard discussions. Uh, and it could stop tomorrow if we chose, uh, all of it could stop tomorrow if we chose it. So that becomes the question, why do we choose to keep going down these pathways? And it's usually because we don't view Black people as human. That's just what it comes down to. Um, but anyway, uh, their peace plan looks at decade by decade, if everyone would agree to do this and we do this, and then the next step we do this, we could literally in 250 years achieve peace. Um, and that's a long haul goal that it's all possible because even the civil rights movement you can back it up to 1919 with the killing of black soldiers and it takes literally all the way up to this that we get another incident but keep in mind none of these incidents have stopped this is it's not like suddenly this violence came out of nowhere it's just been non-stop mm -hmm. uh, and so as we move forward there comes a point when the quilt just has to physically stop being made go back to the black has to stop being made but when we calculate 250 years from um 1885 when the official rows start to get counted then there is a block of fabric for each of those years so that we can bead and hopefully uh eventually we won't be able to add beads but as we have seen what has happened even in memphis now we have a bead for tyree nichols that has to be added onto here right um so if you move forward 
it is based on a modified um, poster stamp quilt because we had to literally all of these are community based works had to kind of think about how do you find a way to mass cut it up so lots of people can participate, uh, but still be able to honor the individuals that we have. Um, and so when you get to sections where you see these little yellow and green, those are actually for the children that we have in the roles. When, and I don't know if you can see it, I, mean, I have these like glasses that have these filters <laughs> because of the computer. But when you get to the sections where you see pinks and purples, those are actually the women that we've been able, oh, okay, so you see it here yeah. uh, at the bottom. And the, I mean, you usually see like the women and children are together, that means a family's been taken out. Uh, which is not uncommon that you would see a mother and three children or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so the quilter, I think these were photos before we took, we quilted it. And we actually used a, a, a magnolia leaf, a magnolia blossom as the way, because then it harkens back to strange fruit. But you can see here where the blacks are, the black stripes are, so that we can add more people as we go. Uh, if you want to go to the next one, I don't think the next picture is a good one. I'll keep going. But that was the uh, keep going. We document all the horror of the because 15 feet of fabric on your head is not not cool. <laughs> it's just a lot. <laughs> uh, but because it is community based, uh, I'm always focuses that the audience is three to 103 and then beyond if you can. And so there are ways to talk about lynching and violence with young children and have them find a way into the process. So this is a community event um, called Quilts for Social Justice. Uh, I think, I can't remember. It was Quilts and Justice somewhere, uh, <laughs> somewhere in there. I lived this so long ago. But him and he, he was five and his brother was three. And we really talked about, have you ever seen someone be mean? Well, yes. Where have you had, or have you ever had somebody be mean to you? Well, yes, I have, because kids, kids know what the world is like very soon. And we were talked about if you could make a blanket for your friend, how would you want it to be? So the fabric just lays out, and then they picked uh, the stripes and the pattern, and this becomes the uh, how the blue gets broken up that okay. uh, this becomes the panel that gets sewn and then it gets cut up and then everything has to be counted um, but there's ways in for everyone and so we do use these to teach in schools um, and I'm actually I know one of your questions were how do you get to quilting I'm actually trained as a bra sculptor I came to quilting in a a really backwards way because I was actually talking about the story of a woman named Laura Nelson and her um, three children that have been lynched and um, different art mediums allow you to have different languages so there is some of the lynching work that's in ceramics there's lynching work that I have that's in uh, metal but those are different discussions and how do we create space for community to have these dialogues because community has to have these dialogues um, and just constantly asking that question, what do we do with it? Eventually it became that using an art form that is associated with women, that is create space for community to come to the table, that quilting became the way forward. And so this is the third quilt in the series, but they're named when they become the idea, not when they get completed. <laughs> so it was not the uh, third one completed. I think it was probably number five but it was the third one in the sketchbook uh before we move forward okay. and that you know it's it's just there's so much that goes into this quilt and you know you just have to stop step back look at it take it in um i wanted to make sure that people read about your quilt including all the details that you just shared with us um, this is next to the story of Mary and Hayes Turner um, talking about what happened to them, um, including them. I give them a background about Strange Fruit and how the story came about, uh, as well as the song for, you know, with Billie Holiday. And then, you know, of course, um, Nina Simone. So introducing 
these two words of strange fruit and associating it with lynching and then tying it all in as you move through the exhibition with people and women that have been victims and making sure that we still tell that story because we often associate lynching with black men or police brutality with black men. And I, you know, I think it's amazing that you include the story of children and women within this um, quilt so that people can understand. Lastly, I just wanted to mention really quickly here, um, out, you know, partial listing in 2017. And, and I know that you have Miss Ruth Helen, and I know that she's also a part of the picture as well as being quilted with the partial listing. And just, just bringing it all in, I think it's so important when we look at the website, just seeing how involved the community was in creating this quilt. And I just wanna say thank you for bringing the attention to everyone about lynching through quilting. So that um, pretty much is everyone in talking about our quilt Quilting with Say Your Piece. I know that we're running out of time, a couple minutes left um, to talk about um, just overall what you felt about Say Your Piece. And I know once again, this exhibition is coming down. The great thing is we're going to do a open mic where your quilts are the inspiration for a spoken word open mic contest for February 17th at the National Quilt Museum. So I'm super excited that we get to use your quilts as inspiration um, and, and get a chance to have people really share and say their piece after you have shared your piece with the National Quilt Museum. So as we get ready to prepare to leave, just some upcoming projects that we can look forward or see and how you feel overall about Say Your Piece, Black women, mothers, martyrs, and misunderstood and your quilts being a part of this exhibition. I don't know who, oh, everyone's muted. I'll go first. Muted. Just, okay. <laughs> Yeah. Um, because I wanted to have an opportunity to say thank you to Stacy. It's been a, an amazing journey for me. My daughter and I made a little road trip to Paducah, which had been on my bucket list. And so this made me uh, really go ahead and do it. And we had a fabulous time. And I just hope, because I make happy quilts, I you know, I just hope that my quilt will make people reflect on what they can do uh, to make the world a better place. Thank you. I can you guys hear me? Yes. I also wanted to thank Stacy for this wonderful opportunity to be a part of this phenomenal group of uh, female black quilters. Um, like some of you have said, like I never intended that quilt to leave my uh, the spot on the wall downstairs uh, because I most of my quilts are just um, you know for for family viewing. Um, I can thank Ov for putting it in her show, and that's how it got to you guys. But it, it you know um, it was never intended to hang on the wall in the uh, National Quilt Museum. Um, and I've just really enjoyed uh, the process of um, being a part of this. And I, like I said, I'm so thankful to work, to have um, be a part of, uh, you know, all you, like I said, phenomenal um, African-American quilters. Um, so. Thank you, Nicole. Please bring it up. Uh, we'll jump in here. So first off, we just want to say thank you so much for allowing us to be part of this moment. And I'm so excited to see the impact of it because I know everyone's pieces are so amazing and I look forward to hearing more about the conversations around each one. As far as what we plan on doing next, uh, it, this has really opened the door for more historical pieces. We have a John Lewis piece that's going to be a part of the Ohio Innocence Project that we plan on auctioning off to help those within our community. Uh, we have another one with Langston Hughes. So this really got us into having more conversations that then we can share with our audience online to go, hey, here's some people that you maybe aren't part of the big people as far as Black History Month is concerned. It's not just necessarily Martin Luther King, 
Malcolm X. Like, let's talk about some of the other maybe lesser known heroes that got us here. And while we still have a long way to go, let's talk about them. Let's learn about them and, you know, make things a little bit better if we can. And my second first exhibit, the Grand Valley Arts is going to be hosting three of our pieces. We have a high up instance project. It's a bunch of boys who volunteer their time to help incarcerate people who need to be out, get out. And our pieces are going to be on that form and we hope to bring awareness to that agency. Um, the last person that got out was in jail for 45 years and he shouldn't have been incarcerated. So it's an amazing project. And because of this, we have these doors opening for us, which is just amazing. So, and I want to say thank you because you are the reason why I have Ida B. Wells Barnett behind me. And this uh, amazing quilt that you have made for me is hanging up. And thanks to you. Um, for making me this awesome quilt. Well, thank pleasure. you. Oh, sorry. I thought you were You're fine. We're done. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I wish I could have got down there because I love to see when the quilt can get unfurled in its massiveness because and I'm glad you were able to figure out how to get it up there. Um, and I look forward to seeing more pictures of everyone's, especially now that you've talked about a Mary Turner piece. I, I definitely need you to send me that that picture so I can see that. And yes. just an opportunity. And yeah, and it's it's the context that is associated with your quote, giving people a background about lynching and in, in what has happened in, in, in the United States. And I think a lot of people don't know about Laura Nelson. They don't know about Mary Turner. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that I was speaking to their story um, with a partial listing because they are Black women. And we can wrap up with you, Ms. Sean. <clears throat> yeah, and I wanted to say thank you for uh, everyone sharing your story here. Um, I have a lot of Googling to do tonight um, to see more of your work. Um, keep making it, keep putting it out there. It's absolutely important for us to continue letting the nation know that Black, black women make quilts too, and they are of great significance. Um, I My quilt that's called Still Not, uh, the culminating sentence is I am still not free, has been purchased by the Smithsonian Art American Art Museum and is on display in the Renwick Gallery through April. And so everybody stop by. Um, and I, I recommend that you try to touch it because it's got cool stuff to touch in it. Um, but if you're arrested, yeah, call me, I'll bail you out. Um, and, <clears throat> but the Renwick Gallery particularly is out there on the forefront purchasing craft made by uh, black women today. And so keep putting your stuff out there and I'll keep linking you in all my on all my venues. So just let's stay connected. Thank you Thanks so much. And I once again, thank you for being a part of my first curated exhibition that focused on Black women in um, the social injustices that we experience and our Black excellence as we move and continue to move through, because I don't want to focus on just the issues that we've had to deal with, but more so how we have overcome, um, continue to push forward, continue to break these glass ceilings and show that we are here and we are making history. We are pushing forward with our agenda to let everyone know that we are, you know, here. We're, we're ultimately here. And that is exactly what we said that night when we opened up is that we are here and uh, we are making sure that the quilt community knows that we are a part and have been and always have been a part of the movement, the community, and uh, we're not just a trend. So i just like to thank you all and I hope that everyone has a wonderful upcoming 2023 and happy new year to everybody. Thank you and happy new year. Thank you. Oh